Hello. I'm Frances Deegan Horowitz, President of the City University Graduate Center. Welcome to Women to Women, a series of programs for and about us. I'm delighted and honored neurobiologist Mari Philbin is able to join us. Equally at home in a laboratory as well as a classroom, Dr. Philbin is Distinguished Professor of Biology at CUNY's Hunters College. The focus of her attention, learning why some molecules inhibit the regeneration of nerve axons after an injury. The answers provide hope for patients with spinal cord injuries. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. You. Thank you. You actually um, grew up in Ireland. Where? I did. I grew up in Northern Ireland in a little town about 20 miles from Belfast. Um, I grew up at the height of what we call the Troubles when there was a lot of um, unrest and fighting, bombs going off, people being shot. So it was a real relief to escape really those times and go to university. I went to university then in England. And to the University in Bath? The University of Bath, yes, which is a beautiful place um, in the southwest of England. Um, I studied, I did both my undergraduate and my graduate work at Bath, so I was there for quite a long time and loved it. And at what point did you decide biology was for you? I think when I was at high school, I decided neurobiology was for me because I remember being fascinated by the idea of two cells communicating and a synapse is where they communicate to nerve cells and thinking this is how we think. There's something here at the molecular level that allows us to think. So I became very interested and enthralled with it from a very early age. And when you finished your work in Bath, you came to this country? Right. I came for two years, and that was in 1982, and I'm still <laughs> here, uh, for a postdoctoral fellowship. So first of all, I did two years at the University of Maryland, and then I moved to Johns Hopkins. And um, it was at Johns Hopkins that I sort of changed my field a little bit. I was actually started out as an insect neurobiologist. I worked on insects and their nervous system. When I moved to Johns Hopkins, I changed and became uh, interested in myelination. For, for some of our viewers, what is myelination? So myelination, if you think of a nerve as an electrical cord, like an electrical cord, the nerve is insulated. And the insulating material is called myelin. And what that does is allows the signal to pass down the nerve very rapidly. And this myelin, if it's injured, now this is another aspect. So I started out being interested in how this myelin is formed. I then became interested in why do nerves not regenerate after they're injured. And as it turns out, when myelin is intact, it's a good thing, but when it's um, ruptured or disrupted, there are molecules in myelin that actually prevent axons from regenerating. And that's what my lab works on now. And, but evolutionarily, why would this be so? That's a good question, and one we don't have the answer for, but there's lots of speculation. So the idea is it's better not to regenerate than to regenerate incorrectly, to make the wrong connections. So it's a way of stopping bad connections from being made. Um, we don't know why. It evolved that way, but that's one of the reasons. The other um, speculation is that when myelin is formed, it's one of the last things during the development of the nervous system, and perhaps once the axons have found their correct connections, these inhibitors lock them in and stop them from sprouting aberrantly. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and what is specifically the problem you're working on? Specifically, well, we are interested in many aspects of why nerves do not regenerate. We are, have identified one molecule that is present in myelin that's inhibitory for growth. We're interested in how it signals to tell the nerve not to grow. And more importantly, we're more interested in trying to overcome that inhibition. What can we do to make the nerve not see this molecule as an inhibitor. So if, if there is an, uh, a spinal cord injury, for example, um, the myelin is broken, right. and it does not knit back together no. naturally. No, not at all. 
it's not even it's even more complicated than, than that unfortunately they um, so what happens when a nerve in the central nervous system is injured you have the myelin debris the nerve tries to regenerate regrow and it comes in contact with these inhibitors that are strewn all over the injury site so it stops growing with time not only do you have the myelin inhibitors, but you get a scar formed. Mm -hmm. And this scar forms both a physical barrier and also it also has inhibitors to regeneration. So there are a number of things that are going on. Now, quite interestingly, the manipulations that we have identified that allow the nerve to grow through this inhibitory myelin may also allow it to grow through this scar formation. Explain that a little more. Okay. So what we've done is we have identified a mechanism whereby we can change the intrinsic growth capabilities of the nerve such that it doesn't recognize these inhibitors as inhibitory. It just grows right through them. And we do that by changing a molecule that's found in every cell in our body. If we elevate this molecule, it's called cyclic AMP, then the nerve no longer is inhibited by myelin and by the scar formation and it will grow through this inhibitory environment. And does the myelin regrow itself? We're not there yet. Eventually it will have to, if you imagine it, to get a perfectly functioning nervous system after injury. You have to get the axon to regrow, the nerve to regrow. You have to give it direction to get it back to its correct destination. You have to induce it to make a synapse, a functional connection, providing its target is still there and it hasn't degenerated. And finally, when you've done all that, you have to remyelinate. You have to form myelin again. And is it, is it easy for the body to reform myelin? It's, um, in the central nervous system, again, no. In the peripheral nervous system, it seems to remyelinate much more readily. In diseases like multiple sclerosis, of course, myelin is lost and the nerves uh, short circuit, they touch each other and eventually they stop functioning. Now there is some indication in, in patients with MS that there has been some degree of remyelination and demyelination, so it's an ongoing process. There's been a lot of work recently on endogenous neural stem cells and encouraging them to come out and make myelin. Now this is in a, in a animal model where demyelination has been induced by treating the animal with a toxin or something like that. Um, and there has been a, quite a lot of success using um, both transplanted stem cells that have been induced to become the cells that make the myelin before they're put back into the animal. Of course, there's been a lot of controversy over right. the whole concept of stem cells, but these are not embryonic stem, stem cells. Some of them are embryonic stem cells, and I'm talking about this is all in animal work, not in humans at this point. Um, but the same could apply, that would be from humans, if these embryonic stem cells from rats are successful in remyelinating, both in a spinal cord injury because in a spinal cord injury, it's not just severed nerves. Sometimes the nerves, are, are quite often, are just crushed and they lose their myelin, but they're still intact. Mm -hmm. So you might get some degree of functional recovery if you can remyelinate them. So where do you come out on all of this stem cell uh, research controversy? Right. Well, I think that no avenue should be closed down. We don't know enough about stem cell biology to shut off anything. Um, any line of investigation at the moment. The lines, the human lines that we are supposedly allowed to work with can never be transplanted into humans because they've always been, all of them have been at some point been in contact with what we call feeder layers which are mouse cells. So they could never be used in human transplants. They're also very difficult to get a hold of. A lot of them are um, with companies and they don't give them out readily. In addition, a lot of them have changed. They've been in culture for so long. And it's my belief that we constantly, continuously have to develop new embryonic stem cells to work with and human ones as well. Because there are very m big differences between working with rodents like mice and rat stem cells 
and human stem cells. Is this why people like Nancy Reagan and Christopher Reeves felt so strongly yes. about opening this up? Right, absolutely. As I said, I mean, I don't believe stem cells are going to be the answer for everything, but we don't know enough about how useful they will be. We don't know enough about how they work. We don't know enough about how to manipulate them to close it down. The ideal world, eventually, of course, we could use stem cells um, to replace neurons that are lost in diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, in neurons that are lost in spinal cord injury, and in other cells, the cells that make myelin in spinal cord injury and in multiple sclerosis. Do you understand why there's such strong feeling against using these techniques? Well, I think it's the difference between um, when one believes life begins and um, the opponents to stem cell research believe that once you have an embryo at whatever stage, be it only a two, ste two cell or four cell stage, a blastocyst, that that has the potential to become a human being. And the embryonic stem cells that, for instance, you might want to use right. ultimately in research, how, how early in their formation are they useful to you? Very, very early. I mean, it's a mere um, cluster of cells. It's only maybe, I can't remember how, what stage we use. I think it's the 32 cell stage. But it's a mere speck in the dish. It's, it's nothing. And these could never become Human humans. Beings. No. So do you work with colleagues to try to influence the policies on this? I have spoken on some panels with Christopher Reeve. There was a debate that was uh, hosted by the AARP and we had a question and answer series. Um, he was a wonderful advocate for he was. stem cell research and for spinal cord injury. He brought awareness to the public that no one else has really done. And he was so articulate in being able to present his views. He's a, a big loss to all of us. He must have been very interested in what you were doing. He was indeed, yes. We were, um, he you know, knew my work, was able to talk to me about it, and understood it perfectly. Um, so we had many conversations about it, and he was very encouraging, of course. Well, this identification of the, of the things that inhibit right. the regeneration, I mean, that's, that's almost the golden key, isn't it? Yes, but now we have to overcome them. And not only that, but get we've got the axons in animals to grow a short distance by blocking these inhibitors, by changing the intrinsic growth state of the nerve cell. But now we have to get them to get them give them a boost and get them to grow a long distance. And is, is that boost going to be ultimately a drug? Could be, yes. Again, it could be a combination. I don't think that any one treatment is really going to be the complete answer to spinal cord injury. There are lots of different aspects, as I said. Maybe by trying to dissolve the glial scar, we can um, encourage more growth as well. We give an extra bo boost to the nerve cell just to get it to grow. We don't know what that is yet, but we're still looking. Let's talk a little bit about your being at Hunter College mm -hmm. and a member of the doctoral faculty in biology with the Graduate Center. Um, I think a lot of people would say, how come you haven't left? How come you haven't gone to MIT or Harvard or one of the big schools right. known for high-powered biological research. Right. What's kept you here? I've been successful, and Hunter has really um, nourished me and my work. Uh, I don't think I wouldn't, would have been as successful in one of the big schools. At Hunter, I did most of my work, nearly all of it, with graduate students, whereas at Harvard and Columbia and places like that, most of the research is done with postdoctoral fellows. What's the difference? Well, a postdoctoral fellow is a graduate. They've already received their PhD and they're further along in their training, and they do a postdoctoral training for maybe, it used to be two years, but now it's four years before they go on and get their own independent position. So they're more experienced and they... Wouldn't that make it easier? It can and it can't, but I had wonderful students. Fourteen students have graduated from my lab since I have been at Hunter. Um, they've all been very successful. They've all, all gone on to do great things. Um, 
And would I have had that number of students had I been at Harvard with a competition for graduate students is even greater. Um, it, it has suited me very well. So yes, I've been asked to look at jobs elsewhere, but why fix something that is working, why, that is not broken? That is not broken. That's what I was trying to say, which, you know, it's still going really well, and I love being at Hunter. Where do your students come from? All over the world. From, well, from New York, um, from the Bronx, from Long Island, from uh, Staten Island, and then I have students from Afghanistan, China, um, Israel, uh, Afghanistan, Sudan. Um, you could have your own United Nations We meeting. could indeed. <laughs> English isn't the first language of the majority of people there. <laughs> so it's a, it's a wonderful atmosphere to work in. You've played a role in um, something that CUNY is very proud of, of bringing into the biological sciences um, American students who normally are not seen in labs. Right. Yes, these are kids who have uh, not had the best opportunities earlier on in their lives. Low-income families, uh, a lot of them are underrepresented minorities, and they have pulled themselves up by their bootlaces to get to graduate school, and they are a real pleasure to work with. It's wonderful to see them go on to places like Harvard or Rockefeller to do their, their postdoctoral training. And one of my underrepresented minority students just got her first assistant, excuse me, her assistant professorship at uh, the University of California, so I'm very proud of her. Um, talk a little bit about the pipeline uh, of, for the future of science right. in this country both in terms of our domestic students and in terms of how dependent we have been on international right. students. I think from a, a point of view of just getting the research done, and we need to do the research, it's an underpaid job, and we have relied on um, foreigners both to do the research and to train them to send them back to their own countries from as far back as I can remember. That's why I came here in the first place. With this new security since the uh, September 11th attack, it's more and more difficult for students to get visas to come to the United States and to stay to work. Um, I think it'll be very damaging if it continues. We're still okay in terms of um, recruitment, but I think it is suffering in, in certainly some students from the Middle East are finding it great difficulty and from Pakistan and India in getting visas to come here. You know, it's interesting because um, while nationally there has been a decline in international students, here at CUNY, right. this year at least, we did not have a decline. In fact, we had a little bit of an increase. Right. Um, so That's good. good for us right. and good for CUNY. How much more, though, can we do to increase the pipeline of domestic right. students and particularly minority right. students going into science? Well, I think we have to reach, reach out to the high schools, and Hunter does that, in fact. We have high school students come and tour the labs and see what's going on and what it's like, and we give them little talks. Um, I have two high school students in my lab at the moment working. They come one day a week and do experiments. I think you have to expose them to science, and also good science teachers at high school, which is key. That's what really whetted my appetite for science was the excellent teachers I had when I was at high school in Ireland. So I think by doing that and also encouraging them once they're in Hunter or one of the other CUNY colleges to work in a lab to expose them again to research and just turn them on to it. And you've had some federal funding to oh, do lots. that? Yes, yes. To, oh, you mean for the high school students? Well, they get a little stipend from one of my NIH grants or something like that, but it doesn't cost very much. Usually they volunteer. Talk a little bit about funding for so, research. So again, um, because I'm in a, a field that is very hot in terms of uh, funding, we are very well funded at the moment. Also because I have a wonderful lab and things have just gone very well in the last few years, so it's very exciting. So I'm well funded at the moment. 
um, I'm funded from the National Institutes of Health, NIH. Uh, I'm funded from the Multiple Sclerosis Society and interestingly from New York State. Now what New York State has done for the last four years I think, well they've been collecting the money for longer than that and this again was at the instigation and, and pressure from Christopher Reeve. For spe speeding violations they add an extra fine onto the speeding ticket oh. and all that money goes into a pot and it has to be used for spinal cord injury or head trauma research and I'm very well funded through that. Um, I also have a special grant from NIH which is called a SNRP, a Specialised Neuroscience Research Program and it's to promote neuroscience research at minority institutions. And what does that mean? Well what that means is to strengthen neuroscience research that's already there. So some of the junior faculty who had not received outside funding, they were funded for a couple of years to allow them to write um, proposals and to get preliminary data. It's also allowed us to recruit two more neurobiologists to Hunter. So the idea is to have a core of strong neuro neuroscience researchers at Hunter College. And uh, that's coming along very well. Um, you say Christopher Reeve was instrumental in the state right. thing. I, you know, I think very few people know about right. that. Maybe if, you, if you've had a speeding fine, you know about it. Yes. Um, it, because so many auto accidents do end up uh, with uh, people right. having spinal cord uh, injuries. Yes. Um, what, when, when did this... Uh, I think it, was, it started about five years ago and they started giving out the money about four, no maybe it was six years ago um, and they started giving out money uh, five years ago and last year I'm part of a consortium with uh, uh, about five different scientists throughout the state and we have an enormous grant which is a, called a translational grant. It is to push the findings in the lab to the bedside, to the clinic. And that's in collaboration with uh, Dr. Rajiv Rattan at the Burke Rehabilitation uh, mm -hmm. Institute in White Plains and people at Columbia and at Cornell. So that's a, a, a lot of money. It's three million dollars a year for oh. five years. Oh my goodness. So that's from the state again. And pushing the lab to the clinic, right. to the bedside, are we there yet? I'm a basic scientist, I'm not a clinician, but I've become more and more involved in looking at what it is required for a clinical trial to go forward. And it's very difficult. The criteria that have to be met before you can go to the clinic, I'm, it's a learning experience for me. So are we there yet? I would not be surprised if there were some treatment, some novel treatments for spinal cord injury in the clinic in the next three years. That's very encouraging. Yes. And this would be a drug? It would be a drug, yes. Or it could be an antibody, a molecule, a little peptide, um, which would perhaps block those inhibitors and allow them to regrow. The that, exons. that would be it very, would it would be very exciting. Yes, if it that would happened. be wonderful. What's your what's your view about um, funding from the National Institutes of Health? Right. With I mean that budget was doubled for right. over five years, but it's slowing now. Yes. And the problem is it doubled so there are twice as many grants that were funded and they are all coming up for renewal and there isn't as much money to fund them all again. So the pay level has dropped about three years ago. NIH in the section that I'm interested in or where I get my funding, they were funding up to about the 28 percentile. That has dropped to 14 in the last year. So it's tougher and tougher to get funding um, from NIH. In addition, a lot of money is being um, not diverted, but now being used to study uh, bioterrorism. But there's no extra money being put into the pot for all the other programs. Of course, bioterrorism and other kinds of terrorism will have their, if God forbid it would happen, would have their own effects on spinal cord injuries. Absolutely. And so the kind of work that you're doing is absolutely essential that it go forward. I sat on an NIH study, um, the Council of uh, 
Advisory Council for the National Institutes of Child Health and Human right. Development, and we could see right. the pay line going right. down and down and down. I know. It's r very worrying. I mean, people who had a very good score and would have been funded two years ago are now outside the pay line, and they have to wind up their labs, and it's... It's very worrying. Yes, indeed. and scientific advances come out of a critical mass of people all over the country Absolutely. working, working, working yeah. until the solutions begin to come up. That's right. Well, you're doing wonderful work, and, and your students love you, and uh, we're very happy Thank you. Uh, that you're at CUNY and at Hunter College, and I'm sorry that we're out of time. My thanks to Dr. Mari, Mari Philbin of Hunter College for joining us. For more information, you can go to the following website biology.hunter.cuny.edu. For the Grad City University Graduate Center and Women to Women, I'm Frances Deegan Horowitz. Thank you.